Oh, look at this. Kyle. Thank you all so much for joining and welcome to our webinar today. So we're going to we're going to provide an overview of the small business innovation research program and the small business technology transfer program. So our presenter, Heidi Platt, she's going to share several key characteristics and requirements that can help you to become more familiar with SBIR STTR programs such that you can decide if they are a possible funding opportunity for your technological innovation. So Heidi is the owner of Platinum Grants and Proposals and has been providing consulting services since 2007 to businesses and, and investors seeking SBIR STTR grant funding, having helped develop, having helped, sorry, clients develop over 75 million in grant applications. Heidi's expertise includes proposal development for several federal agencies, including USDA, DOD, DOE, HHS, NASA and NSF. NASA gets the whole word, not just the acronym today. <laughs> Prior to forming Platinum, Heidi served as PI for NASA, phase one and phase two SBIR projects. So take it over, Heidi. All right, sorry we're getting started late. That's my fault. Um, appreciate you guys hanging in there. Um, so yes, today um, we're going to be talking about SBIR SDTR 101. It's a general overview of the whole program. And um, first we're gonna talk about the program and then proposal preparation steps and phase one proposal overview. And then we'll leave some time at the end for questions. Um, I think Sherry, if we go ahead and let them just put them in chat, if you have them, or we can wait till the end. We're gonna try and leave about 15 minutes towards the end for any questions. And um, please feel free though, as, as if you want to start putting them in chat as you think of them, go ahead or save them for the end. Great, so first we're going to talk about the SBIR SCTR overview. And that's gonna mean, we're gonna talk about SBIR and SCTR. We're gonna talk about the three phase program, type of projects funded, eligibility, participating agencies, SBIR, STTR success rates, and SBIR versus STTR. We'll cover that last. So first of all, let's, what is SBIR and STTR? Well, I've given you the, I've defined the abbreviation there for you. And basically both programs are to commercialize a technical innovation that has high risk. And the difference uh, with the SBR and STTR, as you can see, the STTR requires uh, US research institution involvement. The SBIR does not require it. You can have research institution involvement, but you are not required. That's the basic difference. I will discuss in more detail the differences in a later slide. So I'm going to move on to the next topic here, the three phase program. So SBIR and STTR, it's typically, you usually start with a phase one, you go on to a phase two, and then finally there's phase three. Normally phase three is not funded uh, through the agency, uh, unless there are uh, a couple of agencies, NASA and um, DOD it might be your first customer. And so that's an exception. Most of the time um, you will have, you receive funding for phase one and two, but not phase three. That's where you should be at a point where you should be able to get outside investors. So phase one, that's going to be your feasibility study. That's right now you have an innovation. You have something, uh, something that you're trying to commercialize, but there are too many uh, technical hurdles and questions and risks involved that you need to get answers to or to figure out how to overcome in order to get in outside investors interested. And so phase one is a great opportunity to start there where you're going to go, okay, what do I need to do next? What is that first thing I need to do in order to get closer to commercialization? So phase one would be your opportunity to prove feasibility, to help answer those uh, first hurdles you're trying to get through. And depending on the agency, they're all a little bit different on how much they fund and the, dura the duration of the project. This is just in general, it's around 175,000, but it can be up to 275,000 depending on the agency. And even more than that, if you're with NIH, they have some waiver topics. Um, they have some topics where they will allow up to 325,000 for phase one and, and two years. So this is just a general, this table I've provided is, a, is just a general across the board. There obviously are exceptions to the rules here. Um, phase two then. So you finish your phase one, you prove feasibility, and then normally the process is you would submit a phase two proposal. So the phase two then would be taking what you learned from phase one and further refining your design and testing and doing additional 
um, closer to commercialization steps where you're going to get to a, a more commercial product. Um, so phase two would be developing it. it Typically, it's developing a prototype, uh, and most of the time, it's taking what you've had and you're making a more refined uh, MVP or uh, a beta version and, and doing some more formal uh, testing since you have, as you can see, more funding, uh, 600000 or up to $1.8 million. It could be even more than that, again, depending on the agency, and you'll have more time, two to three years. Um, and then once you finish your phase two, there's additional like phase two B funding with some of the agencies. Um, there's some of those funding, if you can get outsourced, uh, outside uh, sources of funding, um, sometimes there's other opportunities to get additional uh, phase two B grants. Um, and then you have your phase three, where again, at that point, once you finish your phase two, hopefully you're close enough to where you can start working on commercialization. One thing I should point out, I don't want to confuse you, the funding, the phase one and phase two funding and phase three, um, the funding has to go towards R&D effort. They want you to be folk. They want you to be thinking about commercialization and marketing and 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 working on that. And actually, some of the agencies will provide uh, that time of assistance, such as I Corps uh, with uh, NSF. We have uh, the Midwest I Corps, and I know Sherry could give some more information about that later. If, if there are questions, um, there are opportunities. I Corps is basically where you can do um, your uh, a customer study. Um, going out there to find out what kind of interest there is in your product, getting an understanding of the market, your customers, getting to uh, approach them, making phone calls. And um, it's a great way uh, that that's a great opportunity that some of the, that you can get some, um, there's some smaller, there's shorter meetings, and then there's some longer i -Corps meetings. And um, that's a great opportunity if you haven't had a chance yet, because it's pretty important, especially on depending on the agency. NIH isn't as much so as NSF, for example. NSF wants you to already have approached some of your customers or buyers or um, collaborators prior to um, as a part of your phase one. So remember that your phase one and phase two is is R&D effort. Most of the time, unless you get a phase one match, which um, I think Illinois is in the process of trying to get a match where you can utilize those funds for marketing and commercialization, the phase one and phase two effort should be R&D. Okay, let's move on. Types of projects funded. Normally, most of the time I would say the projects I work, I help clients with, they're, they're developing new technology that's not out there. It's, there's, there's other competitors, there, there are, are, are products out there that don't um, solve the problems that need to be solved. So there's developing new technology. There's also applying existing technology towards a new application. I have an example, one time I was helping a client that was uh, utilizing a product for, uh, for land-based and then they found an application that would work for the Air Force. So, um, but that would require a lot of technical innovation, a lot of new changes they had to make. And finally, you can make significant improvements or enhancements to existing technology. And so the key there is it has to be significant. There has to be significant technical risks and hurdles. Uh, it can't be just taking something and modifying it and making it a little bit smaller without you know, just using commercial off the shelf. There should be some commercial risk involved. Let's move on to next, eligibility. Who can? Who can submit to this, uh, this program the, the, for this funding? You have to be a for-profit company. You have to have less than 500 employees. And more, you have to have at least one person or individual who is 50% uh, that is uh, US, more than 50% owned and controlled by one or more individuals. And um, th that's in a nutshell, the, the requirements for eligibility. Who participates? So um, each of the agencies, there are, I believe one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I thought there was 11. There's 11. I wanted to make sure I didn't forget one on there. There are 11 agencies. And I've listed them here. They all go by different abbreviations or acronyms. So you know, obviously not National Science Foundation on the bottom of the list. Um, that one is NSF and, and National Aeronautics Space Administration. You all know that one's NASA. Department of Agriculture, they go by USDA. So that's something you'll get used to if you start, if you decide to submit to a SBIR grant a proposal, <laughs> you'll get to learn a lot of acronyms and abbreviations. Um, those programs that have um, extramural research R&D dollars, 
if it's they have a hundred a million dollars or more, they're required to have an SBIR uh, program. And if they have a um, billion dollars, they are required to also have an STTR program. So the uh, the departments there list the agencies listed there with an asterisk. Those are the ones that participate in uh, the STTR as well as the SBIR. And there are it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six now. There used to be a five, but the USDA uh, recently, just this solicitation period, just uh, added STTR to their solicitation. And we'll talk about solicitations here in a little bit. Um, so each of the agencies, they all do run their programs a little bit differently. They all have uh, different times of the year that they will require you to submit a proposal. Uh, each of the agencies, in order to submit a proposal, there has to be an open solicitation. And they, for instance, NIH will have a solicitation that they have, uh, they have usually typically it's an April, September, January submission uh, for that cycle. And NSF, they will have windows where you're able to submit in March and June and October. So, um, and some of them only have one submission a year. And each of them are a little bit different on what they require as far as how you submit and what you submit. And we'll go, I'll kind of, I'll try to discuss it in general, what the requirements are, but just be aware that each of them are a little bit different and they each have different submission deadlines. And um, I will talk to you here in a little bit about how to prepare a phase one proposal. And that'll be part of that discussion is, is finding a topic in a solicitation. So let's move on. SBIR SCTR success. These, this data that I got from SBIR.gov, this was from their most current uh, fiscal year report, is fiscal year 19, 2019. And I'm showing you, I've got four slides here. I'm showing you this data to give you an idea of how competitive this program is. I mean, it's it's great undiluted funding and and it's it's a wonder, but everyone wants to submit. So you get a lot of proposals that are being submitted. And so you can see based on the table that there is a, how competitive it is based on the number of proposals submitted and the number of proposals that are actually awarded. You can see um, you have as high as 40%, 47% for EPA and as low as 5% really well uh, for Department like, of Commerce. But, but then it's just like learning. Um, there we go. Okay, so, and then we'll move on to, that was for the SBIR. That's the SBIR statistics. So here we go to the STTR. And again, there's fewer. And we don't have, obviously, we don't have USDA statistics yet because they just started their program. And um, so you can see it. And, and I have a, for fiscal year 2019, for total, all SBIR, STTR proposals, there were 21,299 proposals submitted in 2019. And the agencies made 4,000 and two new phase one awards. So that gives you an idea of the number of proposals that are submitted. Here is uh, the next couple of slides are for uh, phase two. And so there you can see your selection rates will go up a little bit because the pot of people, the number of people submitting the proposals has been dwindled down a little because only those that submitted a phase one normally, unless it's a direct phase two, which I will talk about here in a little bit. Normally you have to go from phase one to phase two. And so those individuals, there's fewer people submitting a phase two. So obviously you're gonna have a higher percentage and, and hopefully you've done what you said we're going to do and you approve feasibility and you keep in touch with your program manager and that you do a good job of, of putting together a good phase two plan based on your phase one and you will be able to get submitted. So that's the SBR phase two selection rates and here's the STTR phase two selection rates. Again, it shows um, it's still pretty competitive with the, the Department of um, the National Institute of Health, the HHS, Department of Energy and National Science Foundation and uh, DOD and NASA, which are contracting agencies and um again like i said most of the time when they choose I'll, I'll explain the difference here dod and nasa are contracting agencies which means they their solicitations will list topics that are of interest to them 
these are specific problems those agencies are trying to solve. For example, in the Army, they might be looking for a battery pack that's lightweight that, that, uh, that someone in the service could carry uh, through rugged terrain and in rain. You know, and they're going to be specifically giving out a, an SBIR or an STTR phase one topic that says, find us a battery pack that'll be, meet these requirements. So, and they'll, they'll, sometimes they'll pick multiple companies, they'll pick two or three, and, um, and then of the two or three, they'll make it competitive, and then for those two or three, they might go on to two of them for the phase two, and then typically, they'll be your first customer, so that's, that's the difference. NIH and Department of Energy and National Science Foundation, they're not your customers, they're not solving an internal problem, they're looking at problems in the world, in, in, in the U.S., and those are those are considered granting agencies, and um, and so they're not going to be your first customer. And when I mentioned direct phase two, I should clarify that it is there are. I said previously that you usually go from phase one, phase two to phase three. Sometimes, for example, Department of Defense and NIH, they have a, what's called a direct phase two where if you feel like you've already proven feasibility through some other funding that you received and you you can demonstrate feasibility, then that would be a good opportunity to be able to sm submit a direct phase two. But you have to find an open solicitation where that's possible. And usually I recommend you talk to the program contact before you decide to submit a direct phase two. The other thing uh, NIH has is called a FAST a fast grant, a fast track, where they allow you to submit both your phase one and your phase two. Benefit of submitting your phase one and phase two as a fast track is you eliminate that window. Normally you have a window. You do your phase one, you finish your phase one, you got you submit your phase two proposal and there's three or four months, five months, and then you start your phase two. Um, the fast track helps you eliminate that. If you submit your phase one, phase two, you just finish your phase one and you move on and you go on to phase two. The risk you take with a fast track, though, is if they don't like, say they don't like your phase one work, work plan, but they love your phase two, they're not going to fund you. You're going to get zero funding. They won't fund one or the other. You have to get them to buy in on both. So that's that's the risk you take. And again, before approaching a fast track, I would always recommend talking to the agency uh, specific contact uh, for that topic or program uh, center. Um, so let's go ahead and 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 I wanted to make sure you understand, I have some clients that look at this selection data, they look at the selection rates, they're like, oh, wow, it looks like SGTR has a better success rate. I mean, 47%, you know, DOD is 20% phase one, and then um, it's 27%. So I'm going to tell you, I would not utilize that as your criteria for determining whether you submit an SBIR versus an STTR, um, because each agency is a little bit different. You need to make sure you understand the difference between SBIR versus the SGTR. And that's what we're gonna go through on the next slide. Let's look at that. And then we can talk a little bit about the success rates too. So, you know, you look at the success rates and say, oh, well, I'm gonna submit SGTR because it looks like they have better success rate with that agency for phase one. Um, and it, that should not be how you decide because there are too many factors involved when there are reviewers reviewing your proposal that are out of your hands. The one thing you can make sure is that you're submitting the proposal that makes the most sense for your project and for your team. So let's go through the difference between SBR and SDTR. Both of the SBR and SDTR are going to be submitted by the small business. So even if you're going to be working with, uh, with uh, say you're going to be working with University of Illinois and, and they're going to do, um, they're going to, you're going to submit it as an SDTR it's still gonna be the small business that submits the proposal and will also receive the funding. And then they would pay the university out of their budget. So be aware of that, that the small business is always the applicant. Um, the durations vary, uh, they can be similar. It depends on the agency. Some of them are six months, some of them are usually, you know, a year, usually it's a year for SBIR. Um, the SBIR duration can be a year also. So that's, it's not always a difference depending on the agency. Um, as far as SBIR and SETR, their extramural budget, if they are participating in the SBIR, they have to contribute 3.2% of their budget has to be utilized for SBIR and 0.45% has to be utilized for SETR. Again, that's not a factor to utilize. Don't say, oh, well, SBIR has a bigger pot, so I should submit to them. Again, 
that's just more relevant for you to understand how that they've decided who's going to have SBIR program and an STR, TTR program and how much budget they're required. Um, so as we already mentioned, is a research institution required for SBIR? No, it's not required. And research institution, um, when I say research institution, that could be a nonprofit college or university in the US. It has to be US. US nonprofit college or university, domestic nonprofit research organization, federally funded R&D centers. Um, those are examples of research institutions. You are not required for SBIR, but you are allowed. And there are limitations though on what you are allowed, how much effort they're allowed. STTR, you are required to have research institution involvement. And the percent of participation of the research institution at a minimum, for an STTR is 30%. So if you're gonna have University of Illinois working on your phase one as an STTR, they have to contribute at least 30% of the budget. That's usually how we determine participation. It's 30% of the budget, the total budget. And you can have up to 60%. Now that's going to include also other consultants, other subcontracts, other sub awards. So, at a minimum, one research institution has to provide 30% of the effort for an STTR. There can be up to 60% towards that one research institution, or you could have multiple research institutions involved and a consultant, but it can't be more than 60% of the budget. At least 40% of the budget for an STTR has to be done by the small business. They have to contribute that much effort. For an SBIR, at the maximum that you can have of outside source resources is 33%. A third of the budget can go towards consultants, sub awards, subcontracts, research institutions total. And finally, the biggest difference, another big difference between SBR and STTR is the uh, principal investigator involvement, um, their employment and involvement. So a principal investigator is typically you're going to be your technical lead for your phase one, and they should have the expertise in order to uh, manage and run the phase one program. Sometimes, sometimes that, that phase, the, the principal investigator um, needs to be with the university. And, um, and in that case, an STTR would make the most sense because an STTR allows the PI employment to be with the small business um, or the research institution. Now, NSF is a little different. <laughs> Again, there are exceptions to all the rules. NSF requires you to have a PI with the company and then a co-PI with the research institution. So you have to have two PIs with NSF. They're, they're different. Most of the other ones will allow either or for SDTR. SBIR, your primary employment, when I say employment, it's primary employment. 51% of the employment of that individual has to be with the small business. So for an SBIR, if you have a PI who works 51% at the small business, they would qualify to be the PI. And then the STTR, that requirement could be with S small business or the research institution. So when I have a client that says, should I submit SBI or STTR? The first thing I ask is, do you have to have research institution involvement that's gonna require more than 33% effort? And if they say yes, then yes, you have to submit STTR. If you have um, the, say a professor at the university, it should be your PI and, or you, they are not 51% employed with the small business. Again, you should probably submit through an STTR. Now I'm not saying go out there and get research institution involved unless it already makes sense, unless it's something you're already doing or you feel like you're going to pursue prior to submitting your phase one because you want to already have a relationship established. You don't wanna be writing a proposal and trying to develop a relationship and a team together with someone who you're gonna to have to work with for six to three years, six months to three years. So if it makes sense and you need that expertise and you need that help with that research institution, absolutely have that involvement. And if it's more than a third of the budget, then you would probably wanna go th through the SCTR, um, that avenue, or if you have the uh, PI has to be with a research institution again, um, that would make sense for the STTR. So there's our overview of SBIR and I've got about 13 minutes. So here we go. All right, so 
Now we're looking at, we know what kind of agencies, and now we're going to start to propose, we're gonna prepare a proposal. First thing you're gonna do is find a topic, which includes looking at a solicitation. Then you're gonna register, you're gonna establish a team, and you're gonna read the solicitation. So let's go through these topics here. Search solicitations. Most of the time you can go through, go to sbr.gov. There's a way you can search open uh, solicitations. You can go to the agencies, the specific agencies all have their own site, website for SBIR funding opportunities. I go to both. I go to sbr.gov and then I go to the agencies. I look at both open and I look at closed. If I can't find anything that's open, I will go look and see if there's something that's happened in the past. Have they funded this type of research in the past? Are they, do they, maybe they're still looking for it. Maybe there's a contact name associated with the past solicitation. You could contact them. So, and also don't limit your, your search to just one agency. When you're in sbr.gov, don't spit, pick, you know, well, this is specific or DOD. I don't think NIH is involved. You never know. So keep it open. Don't, don't pin, pinhole yourself into one area or not. You, you all have so many more opportunities if you look at all the agencies, because there can be, I have a client that submitted to USDA, NSF, and NIH. So there, there, there might be an opportunity out there. So make sure you look at all the agencies. And um, again, there has to be an open solicitation to submit. So once you find a solicitation and you find a topic area that you think is interest, read the solicitation, um, most solicitations will have guidelines on how you can contact um, because you don't want to just say, oh, I found a topic, let's just submit. You want to go ahead and make sure that you're not wasting your time or the agency's time by submitting a proposal if they don't have any interest in, in what you're proposing or it's not a match with what they're, they're focusing on at this point. So each agency is a little bit different on how they want you to contact them. NSF, for example, they have what's called a project pitch. They have an online form and you submit a project pitch and they have, a, they have um, four, they have contact information and then there's four topic areas they want you to provide some information for. So NSF has that way. DOD, they have a specific timeline. You're allowed to ask questions. If you go beyond that, they'll make you send the questions to CITUS. So there's different ways, but if you can, the next thing you should do if you find a topic is either go to the solicitation, find out how you can contact. If it's if it's NSF, it's a project pitch. And, and if it's, um, and, and each agency is a little different. So I'm gonna give you a couple examples here on the next couple of pages. So NIH, for example, you're gonna contact them again, the, the omnibus solicitation or whatever solicitation you're looking at will have a name and an address, an email address. So go ahead and send them an email, trying to get, try to get some consultation, whether it's a phone call or if they just wanna email back and forth and provide a concept paper. Um, I've listed here what you should include. It's, it's a page or less and uh, provide that information and then send an email and see if they'll, uh, to see if they'll uh, make contact with you and you can have a, a conversation about, you know, not selling your product. You're not selling it to them because they're not gonna be reviewing it. You're gonna be getting them to understand what you're proposing and what your funding needs are and to see and make sure it's a match to what they, they're they looking for and that it makes sense. Some of the, some of the so for NIH, for example, some of the centers you'll send, it, you'll send an email to and they'll go, ah, I don't think it's good for us, but I think this other center would be good for you. Um, and, an ex and also be prepared if you sum submit an email, be prepared for them to submit you an email back and say, um, here, I want you to change your paper. I want this in this format. We had this with a National Institute of Aging. I have a client that just submitted a, pro they sent a concept paper to them. And uh, the, the individual who's in charge of the NIA, he said uh, he has a five question format. So we had to redo our paper to submit it. But it, you know, it's a good exercise, no matter what way you're communicating, because it's making you sit down and write down answering these questions. These are very important questions that are listed here. These are questions you're going to have to discuss throughout your proposal. So it's not a waste of time. It's a great exercise to do this and make contact. Here's an example with USDA. Again, USDA, they have what they call their national program leaders, and they want you to contact them for each of their topics. They have a name and an email, and uh, they want you to send them an email just giving them, they just want a brief summary. They don't want a page. They really just want a brief summary um, with those two bullet items and asking for a telephone consultation. And I have a client that did that, and they were asked to do, um, they were given a 30-minute telephone conversation, and it was great. They were able to say, yes, I think that research makes sense. Here's some ideas we have. Yeah, that looks like a good objectives. We think that makes sense. So it's a great process. 
don't skip this step, this step, you need to do this. And, and if you don't hear from them, don't give up, try calling them. There's the phone number. If there's another email associated, try the other email. So those are the, um, those are just the examples that I had on, um, on how to contact. So um, in addition to finding a topic and, and making contact with the agency, you will need to start registering right away. As soon as you know you want to submit, start registration process. And you should start with SAM.gov. Most, if not all the agents, I don't think it's, most of them now I think require some form of registration with SAM.gov. So um, I would start that as soon as possible. It is, um, I just went in there the other day and it was talking about how they are delayed right now if you go into SAM.gov. Um, so they're still seeing some delays because they just switched over to a new, a new process. It's the uh, unique entity ID, the UEI. They're using that instead of a DUNS number. So um, make sure you start the SAM process as soon as possible. And it's, it can take a couple hours to complete. You need, it, it gives you a good uh, checklist on what you should have. You're gonna need your bank. You're gonna need a bank for your small business. You're gonna need a small business. You're gonna you need an EIN um, and contact information. And so it can take a little bit of time and you could complete it and submit it. And then it can take a couple of weeks to hear back or even more I hear right now because of delay. So make sure you start SAM.gov. After you get SAM.gov, once you get that registration within 24 hours, you should be able to go into grants.gov and SBR.gov. Most of the agencies require a, a grants.gov and all of them require SBR.gov. Those are much easier. Those are, you can get those done in a day. Those aren't difficult. And the other items on the list, the defense, the EHB, ERA Commons, PAMS, research.gov, those are all very specific to each agency. And again, those don't typically take a lot of time once you've got all the other registrations. ERA Commons can take a couple of days. It's not the same day. Um, so just be aware of that. Start that process now. And in addition, so you're finding a topic, you've got your registration, now you got to establish your team. Make sure you have the right team involved. Who is appropriate PI? Who do you have involved um, that could help lead the effort? If they're not the technical expert, um, who else do you need to have involved? Will you, will you need to add to your team? Do you need engineering? Do you need software engineering? Do you need someone who can perform data analysis? Do you have everyone involved that, 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 that will help um, accomplish your phase one goal, to prove feasibility and the objectives or aims that you define? And um, if the PI, a lot of times we have uh, professors that are with a, you know, with a university and, and they can't meet the 51% employment requirement. Um, so sometimes they will have to um, have to hire someone or a post-grad student for it. So if they'd be thinking about that, who, who can be 51% employed at the time? And, it, and I should clarify, it has to be at the time of award, 51% employed at the time of award. It does not have to be when you submit the proposal. So that is key. They will allow you to submit knowing that, because a lot of, you know, it's hard to pay my salary until you get the funding. So they understand that. So be aware of that. And also who will support the project? Again, we talked about, you know, uh, research institutions, but there could be other uh, subcontractors, uh, engineering services or, or advisors or consultants. Consultants are the people. The consultants are a person that provides assistance. Subcontracts or subordinates are an organization. Those are organizations that provide assistance. So be thinking about that because you want that, again, that can be a process, especially if you're working with a research institution. It can take a couple of weeks to get a budget finalized and get all the paperwork and everything signed off before submission. And so it's key to get started on that right away as well. And then finally, as a part of proposing or uh, proposal preparation is to read the solicitation. It's very, very important that you understand the solicitation and read it front to back. I even, I do old school now. I even print it out. I still print it out and I highlight it and I mark the changes. And um, because I've seen the solicitation so many times now, I have to kind of look at it and compare it to what I have because they make, they'll make changes. And um, so Make sure you understand there's each agency has like most of them will have they'll have a solicitation, but some of the agencies also have guides and NIH has one USDA NSF. They all have guides in addition to the solicitation that has also requirements in it. So follow all the guidelines in those documents for formatting page limits, what kind of documentation is required and and understanding the evaluation criteria, making sure you understand that. So here are the proposal elements. I'm running a little bit out of time, but this is in general, 
all of the agencies require some form of an abstract or summary. Um, obviously, you know what that is. And significance, that's where you're gonna define the problem and the background. Innovation is the technical innovation, describing the technology. Specific aims, technical objectives, that's key. Defining how you're gonna prove feasibility in phase one, that, that's gonna feed into your plan, which is the next item, your approach, your plan, or your work plan. Um, that's gonna be detailed out. That needs to be the most discussed. That has the most pages, three to five pages typically. Taking those objectives and discussing the details that are required and the tasks, the specific tasks that have to be accomplished. I'm gonna scroll on down. Not all of the agencies require commercialization section. NIH, for an example, doesn't, um, but there are NSF does. I mean, NSF starts with an elevator pitch and then commercialization discussion. So um, each of the agencies are a little bit different. You have your budget justification. They all have uh, specific requirements for that. Letters of support. I wanna hit on this before we go on to the next slide. Don't wait to try to get letters of support to the last minute. When you're registering, when you're already reading the solicitation, you're registering, start trying to get out there and, and get letters of support. And when I mean letters of support, I'm looking for support, letters of support from potential stakeholders, investors, collaborators, users, buyers, customers. Um, those, those are very important and they, they show a lot of credibility as far as commercial potential for your product. It helps the reviewers go, ah, there is a need out there. There is potential. Oh, they've already gone out and talked. It's not easy to do, but it's really, it's really something that you, you're going to have to do eventually. You might as well get started. And even if you can get them started early enough, get them, it could be a letter that says, hey, we love this idea. It's great. We would love to utilize it, but we would rather see them after phase two. We'd like to see them answer these questions. And once that happens, we would love to collaborate or we would love to be a distributor, or we'd love to invest, those type of things. So get started on that. Fine, let's go into writing tips. Okay, writing tips. Okay, avoid common mistakes. I know you're like, oh yeah, everybody. Well, it's I'm serious. Avoid these common mistakes. Don't fail to prove technology is innovative. I know you know it's innovative, but the reviewers don't know it's innovative. And it's your job as in this proposal is to show them that Yes, there's technology out there that does whatever it does, but mine is going to do it better because it does this, 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 and utilizes this new technology that's never been done before. It's never been utilized this way, whatever it is. It's your job to tell them that. So make sure they understand it's innovative. Um, again, I talked about the approach, the work plan before on the previous slide. A lot of times people don't provide that detail that I was telling you that's needed. You can't just restate your objectives and then just put a couple of bullets. It needs to, your approach work plan should take each objective or aim, whatever it is, whichever agency, and you need to tell for each aim or objective, what's the goal? What's the purpose of this objective? Why are you doing this? How are you gonna do this? What are the specific tasks involved in, in accomplishing the objective? What are the metrics? What are you measuring? How will you know you were successful? What potential um, hurdles uh, that you, you envision overcoming for this objective? And that's the kind of detail for each objective. You need to provide that detail and, and to some type of a timeline showing that you understand this objective is gonna be done first, this one, or these are in parallel. Um, finally, uh, the mistake that happens, don't, don't forget to follow the agency's guidelines. If they say one inch margins, one inch margins, please. If they say five pages, do not go over five pages. Um, and, and if they say supply, you know, a summary, include the summary, of, you know, the facilities, the equipment, don't leave anything out. Stay focused on feasibility. Again, this is phase one. So your goals and objectives and your work plan should all be going towards proving feasibility. Keep your writing clear and concise. Again, you, you, most of these documents, they're not gonna give you a lot of pages. You gotta say a lot with very little space. So again, it's very important to be concise and um, use your company name. This is something I, I try to get, all my clients have an issue with this, especially if you have a multiple teams, if you've got a research institution and consultant and you've got other players involved that are helping you accomplish your goals. It's very important to use your company name, avoid third person, don't use we are us, say who it is. University of Illinois will do this. We, our business, small business, will do that. It's very important, do that. Uh, the next page, here we go. Be positive in your approach. We will do this. Don't say, well, if this works, it'll do that. No, you say, we will. 
site references, very, very important. And you should include, there should be some technical discussion in your proposal where you will need to cite references. Make sure you do. Know your reviewers. You won't always know your reviewers. Your, they're your audience. But what I'm saying here is know your audience. Um, most of the time, they should have the background to understand what you're, you're going to be proposing. But don't make it too technical. Make sure, you know, that like, I could read it and understand it, I guess, because I have an engineering background, but I, I'm not going to be an expert in the field you're proposing. And understand the NSF, they have commercial reviewers, people that are in the commercial industry, that's their background. So they may not have technical backgrounds. So understand your audience, know who you're writing to, and, and making sure you're writing towards the goals of the topic that you're submitting to. Use clearly labeled descriptive relevant figures. I can't tell you how much it's important to use figures if you can. It helps reduce the number of, uh, it helps you say a lot with very little. And I've listed some things, you know, provide visual impact and it should add value, not distract. Uh, don't put something there and somebody looks at it and goes, what's this telling me? Make sure it's telling the story you're trying to get it to tell. Follow the rules, all the rules. Again, know your solicitation and the guidelines. Please follow the rules. Finally, be prepared. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of your time, expense, extensive amount of work, 100 plus hours. Um, know that there's going to be a lot of surprises and challenges and delays and turns, but do all the homework, set aside the time and you'll be in and just get yourself prepared. Be prepared. It's 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 worth it. It's well worth it. It's a great exercise. Don't give up if you don't get funded uh, um, the first time and this and the agency allows you to resubmit, resubmit. Look at the reviewers' comments. Most agencies will send you uh, comments. Review the comments. See what they say. Do you think you can address those comments? Do they they were they kind of favorable toward the innovation? They just didn't like how you approached it. Resubmit. If you don't resubmit, you wasted your time submitting the first time. Take advantage of those uh, comments you receive. And finally. Know that developing an SBR application is worth the effort. Again, I, I mentioned this before. You're, it's a great exercise. It's going to make you sit down and think about what are my technical hurdles? Why can't I commercialize? Who's the team that needs to be involved? Is there commercial potential? Who can I start contacting out there and making sure there, there is some interest in what I'm producing and, and that we have the right team and the right plan put together? And finally, take advantage of your local SBR resource, Fast Center Illinois. There's a link there um, for assistance. You can complete the Fast Center intake form. Um, we provide, they provide some uh, SBR, SBR technical assistance and I and there are other uh, counselors that will provide a couple, about five hours of assistance with SBIR and uh, you should take advantage of that using that intake form. And that's the end of my story. Ready for questions. Okay, so I've compiled a list for you. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> And if I can't answer it, I'll try to get back. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, so one of the first questions is, this is, this is an easy one. Um, and that is, may I share your, your the PDF of your slides with the group? Oh, yeah. Okay. You? That's what, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, okay, so we have, and I, I apologize that I didn't note whether these were already kind of touched upon um, during uh, your talk or not. So I'll just okay. kind of throw them out there. Okay. Okay. So one one question is, um, do smaller or larger budgets for phase one have variable approval rates? Question mark. In other question mark. I, sorry, <laughs> typing. <laughs> in other words, I do that. And I'm sounding like a teenager. Sorry. In other words, is it useful to have a budget that is smaller, or does too small a budget run risk of being below scope? Um, below scope for the officers, you know, too okay. small to manage that type of right. thing. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So right. yes, that that is a good question. And I do get that from my clients. So what I always say is if they give you a max 275K, say that's the max. First, determine your feasibility. What do you need to do to prove feasibility? And, and what can you accomplish with 275K and work from there? Um, it is not, I have not found that it's a benefit to request few, fewer funds. Then, you know, in fact, I was just talking today with a couple of grant writers and we were just saying how um, we have, we had one, one person who got an award, but they were going through negotiations and they were told to up their award and another one told them to bring it down. So I don't know that, you know, it's, 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 
I don't, I would not write your grant toward, I wouldn't say, well, I really need 275, but I'm going to only ask for 200 because maybe that'll put me in a better pot. That's not, they're not going to look at your budget. They're looking at your merit and your impact. And, 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 and that's what's important is, is establishing innovation that is com the commercial, describing the commercial potential, what you've done to, to, to demonstrate the commercial potential, and that you have a good team, a good plan put together that meets their goals. That's what's more important. The budget they will look at, but um, they will negotiate if they want it lower. So go make, I wouldn't say don't go to 275 if you don't need it, but if you need that to, to prove feasibility, absolutely use it. That's not gonna, they're not gonna count against you. Okay. Um, did that answer the question? Good, I think so. I know David was one who asked that question. Okay, so I'll move on to this one. Um, are there any incorporation requirements before funding can be awarded? Incorporation. Incorporation um, requirements, like how, yeah, I guess that in terms of like, how does the business have to be set yeah. up in order right. for it to be awarded? Maybe even so much as in order for them to apply. Right. You, you, um, the, so the NSF project pitch, you do not have to be incorporated yet. You do not have to be a small business yet when you submit your NSF project pitch, um, to NSF. Um, but all the agencies before you can submit, you have to register in SAM.gov. And in order to register in SAM.gov, you have to have an EIN. You have to have a banking, um, uh, account for your small business. So you will, before you can submit a proposal, have to be a small business. And you're speaking of like phase one proposal or- Phase you know, one, or, yeah. In yeah. order to register to even, so yeah. you can't submit your proposal without being registered. And in order to register, you have to be a small business. Okay, gotcha. Okay, this is an IB question. So um, here's, here's how it's presented. IP issues for patents, not yet applied for and or provisional patents. So it's in that, in that realm. What confidentiality is guaranteed, if any, when participating? Does applying for SBIR constitute public disclosure, disclosure of an invention? I remember you guys talked about this a little bit at our sprint too. Yes, I was trying to remember what we discussed. Yes, so um, <laughs> basically from what you are allowed when you submit your proposal, you're allowed to mark sections of your proposal proprietary. Now, having said that, please do not mark your whole proposal proprietary because the reviewers get really, they don't like that. And, and the reviewers tend to be respectful of that. And they, um, but you are allowed to mark any section that is proprietary um, with a legend and you can mark it on the cover sheet, depending on the agency, they have their different ways. They, I think, I believe it's five years. I think they have um, uh, the IP is protected, but within the agency though, obviously they're going to see your IP, but they cannot share that IP. Um, so it's, that's why it's very important when most of them require a summary or an abstract. Don't include IP in that in your discussion, in your summary or, or uh, abstract, because those are shared. Mm -hmm. um, now, last week we had this conference though, I heard some good and I heard some bad. I heard, you know, where one reviewer, somebody mentioned that one reviewer, and I don't know how they found this out, but one of the reviewers there <laughs> took some, I guess it was a competitor and they reviewed, and I guess there was some of the technology was utilized. Now that's a worst case scenario. That is, and, that, and if I'm not mistaken, Heidi, I think that came up under, the sort of the subtopic of you can you can actually ask for certain reviewers to be excluded right, from reviewing right. your proposal and people were like well why would you do that and, that and i don't know if that's exclusive to nsf or not but why would you do that and then someone mentioned it kind of came up in that yeah, if you're yeah. if your ip is so unique that only one other person is really doing it in the united states it might and that then that therefore makes them your direct competitor it right, makes sense right. to exclude them absolutely them. thank you sherry that's yeah. right nih and nsf both allow you to submit okay. um a list that of reviewers you don't want to review uh, because of conflicts. So um, there's that opportunity. But again, you are allowed to mark any area. And, and I'm, what, what, what I've been told by, I don't always, I've never told my clients don't include proprietary because I mean, it's pretty important sometimes to demonstrate 
uh, some of the studies you've already done. Um, but um, they were saying, if you're really nervous about it, don't include proprietary information, but you have the option to market proprietary. And okay, they have one other answer. question Yes. in the chat. Let me, I think there's only one other, unless another one's rolled in. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so we have someone, so I posted in the chat, let us know if you have particular interest in agencies. And so we have one that said special interest in um, Department of Defense, EPA, and DHS. So what might you share about those three agencies? Um, what are some takeaways that you feel are worth sharing? Um, for uh, Department of Defense, EPA, and Department of Homeland Security, um, just those, again, the DOD and DHS, making sure that um, when those opportunities are, are, are available, take advantage of contacting the uh, topic authors as soon as possible when there's that window, making sure you understand the requirements. Because um, again, like I said, for DOD and DHS to an extent, they're very specific to um, what they want you to accomplish in phase one. I know it's a feasibility study, but um, they typically will say feasibility study by doing this, this, and this. So make sure you understand that. And um, as far as understanding, again, they're your customers. So make sure that you understand they're, that's your audience. That's who you're writing to. You need them to feel confident that you understand what they want and how you're going to solve that problem for them. And they require the same register. They require the grants.gov.sam.gov and they have their own submission site, making sure you just understand that process and how to use that online site. It's, it's not very difficult, um, but understand that. EPA, I, I haven't had as much experience with EPA. I, DOD and DHS, I have, and that, that's, the, those, that's the information I can provide. I'm sorry I don't have more on EPA. That's great. I, 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 so this is awesome. Thank you, Heidi. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for coming and sharing today. I'm going to put a plug in for a couple of more webinars that are coming up. Um, so one of them is later this month, uh, well, later this week, actually, September 29th. I'm going to put this in the chat. Um, so we have, we have a, a training coming up. It's, it's actually like there were four part series. This is number three. And it's called Overview of Federal Acquisition Regulation. This might be something worth joining if you're thinking about pursuing um, more of like the defense type of contracts. Um, so let me give you here. Let me give you the. I'll give that's the title of it, and then here's the link for it. Uh, there will be one more of those in December, and. I don't have the name of that in front of me right now. We also have a, a another S, a Fast Center SBIR 101 coming up in October, and that's scheduled October 25th, and it's called Managing a Startup business, Startup or Business After the Award. Uh, this is a, a lot of really good information to know rolling into, oh, wait, did I just share that with everybody or not? I have a feeling. Oh, no, hold on, hold on. When I entered those things in chat, I shared it with one person. So the whole, I need to pay more attention. Sorry, guys. Okay. <laughs> we'll get that. We'll get that. person is very appreciative. I'm sure. <laughs> that person is very appreciative. Okay. So I, the, you might be thinking, well, I don't need that information until after, you know, I um, get an award. Well, maybe not. We think that's really good information ahead of time. Um, so let me, okay. So I just gave you the link and the information for the, the DC3 training. I'm trying to figure out if I can get this. There we go. There's that one. And one more link. Sorry, I should have been a little bit more prepared for this, but I wanted to make sure all the questions got answered. There we go. So you have information for the one coming up on Thursday um, about the uh, federal acquisition uh, process and rules and things of that nature. And then the one in October on managing a startup business after the award. So thank you all for joining, hanging in here this long. Sorry, I went one minute over. Enjoy. Sorry for being late. <laughs> you did great. You whizzed right through it. Thank okay, you. thanks.